Now we have Rod Cope, right? Thank you. We have Rod Cope coming on stage uh, to talk about a, a really important topic uh, into, uh, uh, let's say, open banking and uh, let's say the, um, the, the, the digital transformation of legacy industries, which is how to handle security on systems which have been designed to never be open. And actually now they are obliged to be open. So yeah, we're really glad to have you, uh, uh, Rod, uh, there for the event. And we will keep, of course, the 25 minutes you have on stage to explain us uh, what's your vision about uh, the EPI security lifecycle management uh, that you will present. I hope you're doing well. And okay. uh, yeah, the stage is yours, Rod. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. You can share your screen on the third button below the R2 photos. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if this works. Yeah. We see your screen, full screen. Presentation behind. Yes. And you can put it full. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you, Rod. Enjoy. All right. Thank you. All right. So we've, we've heard a lot about in, the, in this conference and, and, speakers and attention in the industry, a lot about securing APIs. And this talk is a little bit different. It's more about securing the API lifecycle. So how do you avoid issues? Because for example, APIs are making it into production that you didn't know were in production. It's kind of bypassed the standard process. Developers are exposing it, maybe poking holes in a firewall, maybe uh, kind of slipping around some security constraints. Maybe things are done manually. And that can lead to some serious issues, of course. Um, for example, almost half the companies you know, in a, a recent survey said they're not confident that the security organization can detect if there's bad stuff, if there's attacks coming in through their APIs that, that are intentionally exposed. And about half the companies aren't even sure that the security team knows what's exposed in the organization. And it might seem a little bit strange, but we'll talk about why that can be. So we're going to talk through the, the rest of the, uh, the time here about how do these APIs come into existence? How do they sometimes bypass security? And how do you start locking that down? Structured your delivery workflows, integrate with CI, CD, DevOps to still go fast, but avoid some of these kind of dangerous loopholes. So I'm Rod Cope, CTO of Perforce Software. Uh, been around a long time, some big companies, small companies, creating and consuming lots of technologies and, and speaking worldwide, had lots of conferences like API Days in the past uh, around the world for 20 plus years now. Okay, so that out of the way, how did these new APIs come about? Well, a, a few different primary kind of vectors. One, new business channels. So if, if you think about um, companies going through digital transformation, right, trying to adopt new marketplaces, partners, digital ecosystems, kind of expanding in the world to create new business opportunities, um, new ways to sell products, new products to sell, you know, kind of harnessing the IP you've already got to make money out of it in different ways. So a lot of drivers from the business. Also, of course, web and mobile applications constantly adding new APIs just to have the UI speak to maybe GraphQL, maybe REST, maybe, RPC and JMS, there's so many ways to, to do it now. You have SOAP and XML and JSON, lots of security. All these ways to get data from UIs, CLIs, et cetera, through partners, through APIs to all the various backend systems. So every day adding new APIs, changing them, adding new versions. And then of course, bigger special customers have their own needs, maybe sort of almost below the radar or, or backdoor integration points, maybe through VPNs, VPCs, other secure channels to get to special data, special data access points, data lakes, et cetera. So lots of different ways uh, companies are adding and, and reasons why they're adding APIs across all the geographies, all the teams, platforms, languages, development tools, systems, uh, teams, right? very diverse, heterogeneous environment, hard to get your arms around that whole thing and making sure nothing falls through the cracks. Okay, so hopefully we kind of talked about some of the ways this can happen. Now let's talk about why it's so important to, to get this right, okay, to, to have a security first API strategy and good enough is not good enough. Well, I think we've all seen lots of breaches and, and things in the news constantly over the last well, 
forever, but it seems to be accelerating. Data being exposed, not just through the traditional web UIs now in, in mobile apps, but through APIs, right? Stealing data, corrupting data, exposing sensitive information maybe you've, you've got in your environment, healthcare information, personal information, sensitive financial data, right? You don't wanna have that exposed, can have very damaging consequences in the market uh, with, with reputations and credibility, customers leave, et cetera. And as you can see on the screen here, sometimes it's innocuous looking APIs that, that do something simple. They don't have access to super sensitive data, but due to an issue, maybe they're exposed without the proper security, attackers can kind of leverage one small hole in, in a seemingly safe API to get to much more important data and cause a lot more damage. So that's accelerating. One of the reasons why this is becoming more important as time goes on, as, as every company is becoming a software company, as the analysts say, there are more and more ways in than ever, right? API is becoming the way you do digital transformation, hook up to the marketplace, work with customers, work with partners, and there's portals being exposed, monitoring hooks, like management hooks, uh, all kinds of ways data can be accessed through web apps, mobile apps, CLIs, etc. And it's not just as simple as this chart shows where there's one API layer. In reality, again, if you're a, if you work in a, a major enterprise, a multinational corporation, there could be dozens, hundreds, thousands of developers and teams creating microservices, separate services, you know, backends for front ends, whatever it might be, written in every language you can imagine, every platform, every approach, every set of tools, every stack. Again, consistency is very challenging in that kind of an environment. You've got analytics bolted on the side. This might be in the cloud, on-prem, as a hybrid. And in addition to this very complex environment you've got going on, you're trying to go faster than ever before. Continuous delivery, continuous deployment, continuous integration. All the teams moving at their own pace, trying to go as fast as possible without slowing down and having bottlenecks. All right, so moving fast in a lot of moving parts. Obviously, there's there's a, a challenge in getting your arms around this and making sure it's consistently safe for every single API in the corporation. All right, so that's kind of the context. So how do you go about preventing rogue services from being deployed, from making sure that you can still go fast with security, integrated into your agile environments, automate things with DevOps, roll into your CI and CD and have staging and production smoothly managed, right? But safe for every single API, not just the ones that you kind of think are the most important because the ones that are kind of uh, given less attention can be the ones that do the most damage. Okay, well, this is where API lifecycle management comes in, the concept of controlling not just the runtime production, the gateway, which is where most people think about API security, but all the way at the beginning of the process, planning, what are we gonna expose? What assets, what, what policies, who has access and to what data, and what should be redacted, how should it be logged, et cetera, through to developing and, and governing the development process around every API that's created, making sure it's approved, et cetera, and then the operational side most people think about. Adding security, adding, adding SAML and OAuth and OpenID and all, and all the other um, runtime type security mechanisms. So it's all of those parts, but then it's also this underlying policy governance across the entire breadth of life cycle. And I think the most important thing here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit this for the rest of the presentation is how do you automate as much as possible? So just like you want to automate testing, right? You want automated CI and CD and delivery and DevOps and container procurement and virtual machine management and deployment and blue green and rollback. All those things are good because you can automate, go faster, safely, as opposed to having humans changing technical data, changing machine configurations, et cetera very error prone, slow, dangerous process. So you automate that as much as possible. Just as important to automate 
policy enforcement and governance. So for example, you automatically enforce all the security policies, workflow policies, approval policies, et cetera, for every API, for every team, at every stage in the environment where you're manual or you're, you're automatically dealing with credentials and environment specifics, et cetera, and not having any manual activities along that spectrum that can do damage and leave security holes. So that's what we mean by full API lifecycle management, like, like an Icona gives across that whole enterprise lifecycle. So some of the key components that make up the lifecycle, one, the concept of a lifecycle manager, which is, you know, this, this ability to handle complex workflows, you know, for every machine in the environment, every user, every role. So you've got the right sign offs, auditing, tracking, ability to roll back, et cetera, for every environment, dev, test, acceptance, test, staging, production, what have you. Um, so again, all that's automated with the right checkpoints, if you will, or human in the loop, whatever makes sense for your environment, that it, it can be fully enforced in an automatic way. And then really importantly after that is to have something we call a lifecycle coordinator, which means once a human has approved, let's say for example, you're moving from the staging to the product, live production environment, you've got the appropriate sign-offs by the right architects, QA people, security, whoever might be in that loop, once that's done, once the human has said, yes, do it, the changes are done automatically. So you're promoting from one environment to the next with this concept of life cycle coordinator, eliminating the hands-on actions as much as possible and deploying all those things that, that vary from environment to environment, the policies and encryption keys and, and, and all the kind of uh, tedious, dangerous parts when it comes to making sure something is secure. You don't want humans involved in that. Once it's automated, it gets um, carried out automatically once there's an approval. And then finally, a repository to keep extensible metadata on all your APIs, the applications, the users, the policies, and to be able to drive uh, workflow and promotions based on that metadata and workflows around the metadata. So completely flexible, again, focused on complex enterprise environments where hardening and security are absolutely mandatory. They're not nice to have. Here's just an example approval process of what that might look like. And now this will vary by company, by environment, but a, a pretty typical lightweight scenario where you have kind of a requirements phase, a design phase, develop phase, and then from there you, you move on to your testing, staging, production. So right from the very beginning, when there's maybe a business requirement, a product manager, a uh, product owner saying, here are the requirements. And the developer says, okay, let's come up with APIs, right, that we want to create to meet those requirements. They may have to get signed off by a local manager, a tech lead, a team lead. In this case, we're showing an architect approving. Once that approval has been granted, uh, the automation kicks in to automatically publish the API. So the right people are notified, the right workflow has been executed with the appropriate auditing, tracking for compliance, et cetera. Move to the de design phase, right? The API updated, submitted with documentation, et cetera. The right processes are followed, metadata enrichment workflows based on the metadata. Again, maybe a separate architect needs to sign off or a second, a different type of person, maybe a security review, a QA review. Here we're just showing again simple architect approval. You get that approval, now you move to, to full development. Develop the API, provide full documentation, full testing, make sure everything's sign off, and again, an approval process. So simple example, it can be as, as complex as needed, completely extensible uh, with all the stages and workflows and sign offs and, and, and uh, metadata. But an example of human in the loop approving the human centric part of this process before you start moving to things like CI, CD, where now the, the code is, is kind of written, it's working in development, let's say it's, it's been tested, passed all the automated tests, passed any manual tests you might have. And now DevOps is kind of involved when you're going through, a, let's say a, a major new rev or a small change, CI, CD, like your Jenkins platform, everything is good, everything is green, now you're ready to move to the next step and next 
sort of phase in the life cycle and, and stage in, the, in your environments. So you might go from, for example, dev platform to a, a specific test platform for your APIs to the staging to finally the production environment, right? So again, no human in loop on those promotions. Those are fully automatic, applying the right keys and policies and predictions. You don't want to do any of that manually. It's way too risky. So here's an example. So why, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to automate all that? And instead of having the DevOps people, you know, kind of do it by sort of by hand, maybe with scripts, maybe with Ansible playbooks or, or what have you, instead of fully automated. Well, one very important reason is in this, in this example, you can see kind of the big roll, bold red production staging and in the bottom development and test. If you're in a secure environment, let's say it's maybe in the cloud, but you've got financial data or HIPAA healthcare requirements or PCI compliance needs or defense, or you just want to have a really secure environment, whether your, your industry mandates or not, these environments may be required by policy, either internal or external or industry mandate to not have direct network access to each other. So the, a breach, for example, in staging or, de or a, a developer doing something in staging can't accidentally expose something to production or vice versa, or a, a hacker coming in through one of these environments can't leverage that to get directly to another environment. There is no direct network connectivity at all allowed. And so in that kind of environment, you have to have this kind of sideband, side, side channel in order to promote things, for example, from development to test to staging to production. That's that life cycle coordinators we talk about that has the ability by being separate and outside that system, but with the, the right keys and credentials can then attach to those environments, apply all the upgrades, the promotions of the new API, for example, a new version of an API, apply those new policies and roles. When everything works, it would then separately attach to the next environment and apply those promotions with those, that environment specific set of policies, users, credentials, et cetera. So that's why it's so important to do this in this sort of a sideband mechanism and why you, you have to automate these things. It's too risky to give any one person access to, to all of these environments or maybe even more than one of them. So example of how this fits into your architecture, right? If you look at the big red box in the middle of the interaction layer, again, that's what I think most people think of when you think API management, API gateways. This is kind of the runtime aspect. We've got all the consumers at the top of the page, mobile web partners, services, etc., IoT, right? Wanting information, supplying information through this gateway that provides things like orchestration, you know, transforming from XML to JSON or vice versa, or, or you know, SOAP to REST or, or GraphQL, right? Transforming data, dealing with quality of service and all those kind of runtime policies. That's one piece of it, but that's not a, you know, the, the, the whole picture. For full API management, you've got to have the things around the sides as well, like developer services, you know, a portal to access what APIs are available to sign up for them, to have approvals, to track and manage, um, to interact, to have chat, all those kind of things that developers need to, to search and properly use and promote and provide APIs. And then you've got the other services kind of bottom left, you know, applying those quotas and policies and, and redacting private data and, and rollbacks and auditing, all those kind of services, absolutely mission critical. And then on the right, Security, absolutely got to have it. You got to have the, the broadest, deepest, you know, kind of security platform in the industry, which, which we have, and apply it consistently across all the APIs, regardless of what language, DAC, tooling, platform, geography, one way to apply it all and apply it all automatically. And then finally, kind of beef that up with your analytic services, not just the, the technical bits, you know, how fast is this API responding and, and SLAs and CPU usage and disk and those kind of things, but also the business analytics. How much money are we making through this API, right? How many widgets are we selling? How many new channels did we open up? How many new partners? All the kind of things that help the business decide if the APIs are actually helping the company or not. And then all that wraps around all your APIs. So if the, the 
kind of the bottom core is your enterprise software, kind of all protected in, in sort of cocooned with all the services and help you need. Okay, couple examples. I mentioned policies a number of times. Policies like automatically applying defense against the OWASP top 10 for APIs, right? So uh, again, consistently applying that across every API in the company, not just some of them. Also applying things like malicious pattern detection. If someone is, is calling your API and they're trying to get JavaScript injection, SQL injection attacks in that call, those can be automatically detected and, and rejected. Right? You can apply these policies again automatically. It's not something the developer has to remember to do or a DevOps person has to remember to do. It can be automatically applied at a high level to all APIs or some swath of them or by department, division, company, etc. Again, automatic is the key. You don't have to remember these things. So what does this look like? And, and in just a few minutes in the expo, we're actually going to have a, a deep dive session that kind of take you through um, a, a lot closer look at the how you actually do this um, you know, with, with a tool like Akana to implement lifecycle management. I'll give you a, a, a quick look here in the, the few minutes we have left. Take, a, again, a typical three-stage environment, development, test, and staging. We'll, we'll keep uh, production uh, kind of on the side for after, right? You've gone through the full QA, you're ready to go to production. So a simple example where a solution architect is required to go from development to the next stage. And it may be an enterprise architect or, or security team can comment on that. Maybe they have optional um, ability to add or request additional information, or maybe, you know, in other environments, maybe they could be required to approve or they can reject, veto, et cetera. But in this simple example, they're notified for optional comments. And then a solution architect, again, is required to promote from testing to the acceptance area or the staging environment. And then finally, an API owner, after that's all done, will kind of initiate a minor version, an upgrade, a non-breaking sort of safe uh, sort of fast track changed and see what that looks like going from uh, kind of promoted from the development portal to go forward. So in the, in a tool like Akana, you'd have an API in development and it's got metadata tags, right? Lots of um, extensible information. You might want to track about it, right? What lifecycle status is it in? What kind of scope? What kind of users? Uh, would use this? Does it have sensitive data? All those kind of things that might help you uh, determine what kind of workflow to apply, right? If it's customer facing, has sensitive data going into production soon, you know, those kind of flags might require higher level approval, more approvals, more sign offs, uh, more scrutiny, etc. Whereas maybe internal use testing only, no sensitive data can be fast tracked. So those are the kind of concepts with the metadata and tags. So an API owner requests approval to say, hey, we want to move this demo API you know, into the kind of development status. Solution architect would approve. You can see enterprise architects and IT security have had the ability to comment, say that this looks okay, this is a good approach, the design is correct, it meets our standards, et cetera, or it doesn't, here's why, add comments. So full history, again, audit trail and tracking why it's approved, why it's not approved, et cetera. And then a workflow kicks in auto promotion to go from that development stays phase to a test phase, right? And again, can automatically take those changes, the new API, the new security roles, policies, et cetera, and apply them to that next environment in the chain right? without humans having to potentially make uh, dangerous mistakes. And then you want to move from there to uh, sort of a pending uh, role where you're, you want to move it to the staging environment. And again, it needs to be approved by solution architect. Could be different set of sign-offs, a different set of approvals, different set of com common chain, you know, has it been scanned with an external security tool, et cetera. All those things can be applied to the workflow. And then finally gets promoted to the staging environment. And again, lifecycle coordinator can make all those appropriate changes. Hi, Rob. We are yeah. we're time, so if uh, you can wrap for people to access also to the workshop we're doing. 
Okay. Yeah, I think I got maybe one slide to go, so good timing. So then uh, if you need to make a minor change, the API owner can uh, start that process and get it signed off. And that was great timing. That's the end. If you want to get started with Akana, there's a quick start uh, kind of package to get you up and running very quickly in a cloud environment, although we do work on-prem and hybrid as well. And as you mentioned, we have in the expo a, a deep dive to take you through lifecycle management and have a lot more time for uh, questions and drill down there as well. Yeah, thank you, Rod. And I don't want to uh, uh, keep you uh, one more minute as long as uh, attendees may want to go to your to the Akana booth for the workshop uh, and the session. So uh, thank you very much for uh, this presentation. And uh, I would be glad to come on Akana's booth to talk about how IAM and IPA management are actually merging at some point for uh, managing API security and, and access control. Uh, uh, yeah, so glad to, glad to come uh, talk about that on your booth. Thank All you right, very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rod. And uh, we see us in uh, like, uh, almost ten minutes at ten twenty at uh, at two twenty uh, for uh, uh, for continuing the uh, the talks. Thank you, Rod, for being uh, speaker. And we see us in almost like a little bit less than ten minutes. Thank you.